something about these uh, uh, different techniques that we saw previously is that uh, you cannot implement them with the, the cadet sequential API that we saw before because that one only allows you to stack different layers in a sequence and if you want to do skip connections or do processing in parallel like in the exception modules and then concatenate and things like that the sequential uh, uh, API does not allow you to do that. So I'm going to talk uh, about the carriage functional API that you can optionally use uh, in your assignment if you want to uh, do more sophisticated architectures and that we're going to use in the um, exercise this week for transfer learning. So I'm going to talk a bit about the idea of transfer learning, then uh, explain the exercise for this week with the carriage functional API that you can then uh, use in the assignment if you want and I'm going to talk a bit about the first assignment uh, too. So the idea of transfer learning is basically to uh, train a network to solve one particular problem but then uh, use what the, the network learned to help solve a different problem. We are transferring whatever the, the network learned from one problem to the other. And the reason why uh, this should work is that often uh, different tasks can share different uh, features, both at the lower level, for example, image identification tasks, uh, whether you're trying to identify animals or airplanes or cars, or things like that, they probably all rely on the lower level patterns like edges, orientation of lines, contrasts, different colors, and those elements once learned and properly represented in the network may be useful in different applications. So in this case we could use the low-level features that were learned by the network to help us solve a different problem that can share some of the same features. Uh, also there may be a um, higher structure uh, that the network is learning on uh, higher level representations. For example, suppose the, uh, the problem of speech recognition Different people have different voices, they speak at different speeds, they have different uh, intonation, the way they say the words and so on, but the structure of the words is the same if they speak the same language. So at some level of the network, if the, the network starts organizing these elements in uh, uh, more abstract uh, structures, there may be something in common between different people and so it can be useful to use a network train for one person to uh, uh, help identify the words on another person rather than just starting from scratch and training from uh, random uh, parameters. Um, so these uh, different aspects of uh, the different problems can change but other aspects can uh, remain the same and transfer learning tries to take advantage of that. There are uh, some uh, different concepts here. So transfer learning, when we are passing from one problem to a different problem, something that uh, may be uh, slightly different from that is not that the problem is a new one, but we are just changing a bit the domain where we are applying the problem. Uh, for example, a common problem nowadays is sentiment analysis, which is trying to automate the identification of how, what the person feels when writing something, leaving a comment and so on. Uh, there are many uh, services online that receive huge amounts of, of comments from the users and it's useful to automate this so that uh, the, the, the people who manage the services can have an idea whether or not the users are angry or pleased or happy and so forth. Uh, so suppose you had a model trained for, uh, to try to find sentiment in uh, customer reviews on a, a movies and, and songs uh, shop online, uh, but now we want to do the same thing for an online electronic store. In this case the problem is basically the same, but the kind of comments may be different. When people are reviewing uh, a, a movie, they will probably use different words than when they are reviewing uh, a CD player or something like that. So uh, there should be uh, some way of mapping from the words to the sentiment that is similar in both cases, but uh, the, uh, the domain is slightly different, the words are slightly different. 
Now, this is also an example in uh, when dealing with natural language. This is an example where unsupervised learning is often used. Uh, for example, denoising of the indulgence and so on. But we're going to talk about this uh, uh, later next week. Um, and this is a, a different approach here that is also based on the these same general ideas that there is underlying structure in the data, regardless of the different problems and the different domains uh, that we're trying to uh, the problems that we're trying to solve in different domains. Uh, but we're going to see that uh, next week. Uh, another thing that can happen is concept drift, which is the, the domain is the same, the problem is the same, but things are changing over time, gradually, uh, and so we may need to relearn something or retrain the models. Um, this can be because there are changes in the relations between the, the inputs and the outputs. For example, suppose that you have a model to try to predict credit risks of, or, or what the, the, uh, the, what services your clients will try to purchase from you and uh, the econ economy is changing. So if, if uh, uh, the economy grows, uh, maybe people with the same kind of, of characteristics like salary and so on will start to consume more because they have a more uh, positive outlook on, on the future. If the economy is shrinking, maybe the reverse will happen. So, uh, in this case, the actual, what you can predict from the data that you have about your, your uh, clients, your customers, can change depending on uh, external, external conditions and you may need to retrain uh, your models. Or, the actual distribution of the data is changing. So, suppose that you start with a with a very specialized store that sells, uh, say, items for gamers or things like that, but then the store becomes very popular and now you have a very different audience and very different base for the customers, then the same models that used to work may no longer work very well. And in these cases, uh, you also, uh, it's not perhaps a good idea to just throw everything away and uh, retrain from scratch. You may uh, keep fine-tuning the same model that you have and uh, adapting it to the new conditions. So this is also similar to transfer learning, only uh, you uh, are not moving from one problem to another or from one domain to another, you are just uh, fine-tuning things to adapt to changing conditions. Uh, so the, the big advantage here is to um, be able to use models that were already trained instead of having to start from scratch. And uh, if you're doing image recognition uh, in carriage, you can use these very large sophisticated uh, networks that were trained with, for example, the ImageNet uh, database, which has more than one million images. These are networks that can take uh, a lot of computational power to train, but now they are available, all the parameters are there, and you can download them and, and use them in, uh, uh, for yourself. Uh, so one thing that uh, uh, this can help us do is to use parts of the network if we want to adapt to a new problem, uh, and then train only a small part left to uh, use whatever the network already uh, knows how to do. And this uh, uh, simpler part can be easier to train with fewer examples, uh, faster to train, and so on. So this will be the, the exercise that you're going to do this week. Remember that last week you used the fashionist data set to train uh, a classifier. So this is the data set, it has these cartoons of codes, and you trained a classifier to predict the class in which each image uh, is placed. These images are 20 by, uh, 28 by 28 pixels and grayscale, which is exactly the same size as the NIST uh, data set. So the images have the same format. And now the idea is that you're going to take the convolutional layers that your classifier learned on this data set, don't change them, just use them as they are, and simply replace the dense layers that do the actual classification. And then use that to classify the MNIST data set. And the, the hypothesis here is that those features that the convolutional layers are learning, for example, the orientations, the edges, the, co the, the contrasts, and the, those things that are represented on 
the, at the end of all the convolutional layers and that serve as features for the dense layers to classify, those may be equally useful to distinguish between the different digits because different orientations, thickness, positions of the, uh, the different contrasts and such may be enough to distinguish all of these digits. So this will be what we're going to experiment with to use the feature extraction power of your first network and just train the classifier for NIST. So basically you need to create the same uh, model or the equivalent model uh, as uh, you had last week because it needs to have exactly the same layers and the same number of parameters so that you can load the weights that you saved from last week and then uh, we're going to freeze to fix the, the weights on the convolutional part this one will not be trained and uh, create the dense uh, layers at the end so the fully connected part with the classifier and that's the part that we're going to train in order to distinguish the NIST digits using those kinds of features that were learned from the fashion NIST. So to do this you're going to use the, the um, uh, functional uh, uh, cache API uh, but you can you start uh, basically the same way load in this case the NIST uh, data set, reshape this so that you have the appropriate shape for the two-dimensional convolutions, which is 28 by 28 and one channel. You need these three-dimensional tensors to input into the, uh, the two-dimensional convolutional layers and normalize everything to be between zero and one, assuming that you did this also last week. If you forgot to do this and your input is between zero and 255, then it should be uh, the same thing now. So check your code last week, otherwise probably the, the, the result will not be good because you're going to be using very different uh, scales in the input. Okay, now the, the functional API of Keras uses uh, this uh, uh, functionality of the layer objects in that they are callable, so they can work as functions. Basically, in Python, uh, any object can be used as a function if it implements the call the special method. So these objects that you use in the layers, the dense layers, the convolutional layers and such, all implement this call method and they can be used as a function on a previous uh, tensor to create the graph uh, for all the computations. And this is better than the sequential API because it allows you to create any graph of computations. The sequential API only allows you to stack things in sequence, which is a lot simpler to use if you just want to do something like a multi-layer perceptron, but if you want to do something more complex, uh, then uh, you need this one. And the way we do this is we're going to create a special layer, this input layer uh, first, where we just say, uh, uh, say what the shape is. We can even give it a name so that we can uh, uh, identify it inside the model, or but we also can uh, assign it to a different variable so we can then uh, pick it out uh, later. And now we're going to uh, add the layers of the original network, this is just a stack of layers, the network from last week, by creating these objects, for example a, a, a two-dimensional convolution with 32 filters and, and uh, this padding, this is the same that you did last week, but we are going to use this as a function on the previous layer, on the input layer. So you see the parentheses there, and this will connect this layer to the, the tensor coming from the previous one. And now we keep doing this, so in this case I, use, I reuse the same variable because I don't care about each individual layer here, I'm just connecting them all one to the other. So I'm creating a graph that is this sequence of layers here, so that I have exactly the same model as used last week. So check your codes and adapt it for your particular models. Now I'm going to reach here and I'm going to uh, use a different name. I'm going to store this uh, particular layer and I can also give it a name inside the, the model, uh, which is the flattened layer that you have at the end of the convolutions before going into the dense uh, layers of the classifier. The reason for this is that uh, after we load the weights, we want to go pick that particular tensor to put into the rest of our network. 
And now we continue the same thing exactly as before, so that now we have uh, exactly the same model as last week. And now we're going to compile this with the, the, the model uh, class, so we create an object of this class model that starts from the inputs, so this first layer here, and ends on this last layer here, the softmax activation. So since we change all of these together, when we go from the, those inputs to the, uh, that output, Keras knows what the model is, it's this whole sequence of layers, and now we can compile that and we can load the waves. Uh, this here depends on the, the, the name of the file that you created, of course, but the idea is that if you create exactly the same model, now when you load the waves, you can load the waves of the model that you created before because we have the same layers with the same number of parameters. What we're going to do now is to freeze this model. So we're going to loop through all the layers of this old model and set the trainable flag to false. So everything that we have uh, here uh, and for which we loaded the waves is not going to be trainable. When we do, when we run fit, those parameters will not change. And now we're going to create a new uh, dense layer. Uh, so a sequence of dense layers. This will be a new classifier. And we're going to get the features layer from the, the, uh, the model here. So one way could be using the, that variable there. Another is just going into the model and taking advantage of the fact that we named this particular layer. So in this case, we are going to get the layer and we want the tensor that this layer produces. So this is the output of the object that has this name, of the layer that has this name in our old model. This means that we are now creating a, a dense layer that receives as input what goes, comes out of this layer of the old model. We are going to create new layers with the, uh, uh, so the activation, dropout, dense and so on. This is just a classifier with the, with the hidden layer there. The softmax activation at the end. And now we create a new model that starts from the input uh, tensor on the old model. So you see the first layer created here had this name. So we're going to get start from here um, and then we finish on this layer here. So basically we are connecting the beginning of the old model, running through all of these convolutional layers here, but then from this layer on we run through these dense layers. So we created a branch and we have a separate uh, dense classifier uh, parallel to the old model. So this is the new model. It's the, the old convolutional layers which have the loaded weights and are frozen. They will not be trained. And then feeding into this new model which will have, will be initialized and will be trained when we run feed. So now you can uh, create your, your optimizer, compile, and then fit. And when you fit this model, all the convolutional parts will use the weights that we loaded and will not be changed because the, the, their trainable flag has been set to false here. Only this new head of the, the network with the dense layers will be uh, adjusted. So the network will use whatever features the previous network learned to extract and use that for uh, classification. Okay. So you can compare this with training the, the whole model from the start, see what differences you have and so on. But basically the, the important part here is to learn how to do these kinds of things uh, and uh, these different models, these branches, and also to use models that were already trained because you have those available in the, in the CADF library. If you're uh, working, for example, with images, you can use those well-known uh, image classification networks already pre-trained. So for the assignment, you have uh, these uh, images. They have uh, uh, images of, of Pokémon on uh, a background of uh, photo, photos. And uh, uh, they are 64 by 64 pixels in resolution and they are color images. So the one difference between this and the example we saw so, so far is that these have three channels at the beginning instead of one and they are 64 by 64 instead of 28 by 28. 
you have the images and you also have these masks which are 64 by 64 but grayscale they only have one channel that indicate the shape what is the shape of the, the pokemon in each image so this is for uh, training validation testing you have this data set here. what you need to do is to solve these three problems one is a multi-class classification problem because each Pokemon has exactly one main type um, and you need things like fire, water and so on and you need to create a network that given the image of a Pokemon classifies it into its main type Multi-level classification is to predict all the types of the Pokemon because Pokemon can have uh, only one type or they can have the main type and the secondary type so they can have one or two types um, and so the difference between these two is that multi-class classification it's only one and mutually exclusive this is what you do with softmax and uh, this one can have one or two so they are independent uh, you, you cannot guarantee that by having one uh, one type it will not have another it may have another two so this would be for each type you have a probability between zero and one of uh, the pokemon having that type and semantic segmentation is basically, uh, if you imagine this, it can be um, a binary classification problem for each pixel. So each pixel either belongs to the Pokemon or it belongs to the background. And you need to create the mask uh, indicating where the, uh, the Pokemon is. So these are the three tasks you need to solve. You have um, this zip file that has uh, the folder with uh, all the images. The, uh, and the CSV uh, table with the, with the list of Pokemon types if you want to look at the images. This has uh, the functions for loading the data and for checking the results. So basically converting the images into uh, the, those tensors that you're going to, to be needing and also for looking at the results. There is this text file with questions that you need to answer. So this is similar to what we did in, in machine learning last semester and uh, this is the main file for your code you can write other modules if you want but you must include this as the, the main uh, file for your code so uh, this function loading the, uh, load data loads all the images into the this uh, dictionary and you have the uh, train and test uh, images this train and test x you have the masks for train and the masks uh, on the test set and the, the, the training set has 4,000 images, the test set has 500. So they are all 64 by 64, but the images are in color, they have three channels, and the masks are black and white, so they only have one channel. Then you have these, the classes for training. This is already one hot encoded with the, the classes for the Pokemon. The labels uh, uh, here, and the, the, the same thing, the classes and labels for the, the tests. So these are the data sets that you can use uh, for, uh, for your uh, assignment and also at the end you can check the results. So if you want uh, to save one uh, PNG file with a group of images, you can say, you use this uh, um, function, you uh, specify the file name of the file, a list of images and the width on, of each row. So basically the number of columns that you're going to have here. So here I, I show the first 20 images on the test set with a width of 10, of 10 meaning there are 10 columns here and as many rows uh, as needed. Uh, this uh, is to compare masks. So if you have two sets of masks, for example, the test masks and the masks predicted by the, the segmentation network, you can create these maps with the, the images, so in this case they are the same images but you can see uh, in the red and green which pixels are present in one mask but not the other. So pixels in white are present in both masks, red and green show you what is missing or in excess in one mask relative to the other. So this basically allows you to compare the masks I provide in the data set with your predictions to see if things are close or very far from, from what they should be. 
and also you can overlay the masks with the image. Uh, basically, this makes everything reddish except the part where the mask is placed, so that you can see if the mask is, is hitting approximately the, uh, the Pokémon. So, but these are mostly for, for visualizing the results, and also if you want to put in the report, because you can include images and refer to them in the VETEX file that you fill. So, you need to build your models, experiment, do uh, training and uh, validation, and then after selecting the best thing, measure the, the error on the test set. So, be careful about that procedure, do it correctly. Uh, use the appropriate uh, functions, uh, uh, loss functions and activations. Remember that you have uh, different problems here. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, multi-class, multi-level, you must be aware of the difference and the problem of segmentation, which is basically classifying a binary classifier but pixel by pixel. So you need to produce something that has the same dimension as the image but it's telling you what is Pokemon and what is not. Uh, you can use simple models created with the sequential API, so if you just do things that are stacking uh, layers, you can use the sequential API. If you want to do things a, a bit more sophisticated or try those other techniques we saw on the previous lecture, you can use the functional API that you're going to exercise with uh, this, uh, uh, this week. You can see the, the documentation for layers, for example, upsampling 2D, you've, never, uh, you've not used before, but you're going to need to do upsampling for the, the segmentation part. Uh, you have these uh, different types of pooling, uh, the activations and so on. Some of them you already used, some you didn't, but you have the, the documentation and you have lots of examples online, so you can uh, experiment with these. This is a very simple data set. The results will not be very uh, uh, fascinating or surprising. But the idea here was to guarantee that anyone can run this on their uh, computer. So this basically should take around two or three gigabytes of RAM, depending on the models that you have and the batch size and such. But it, it should be able to run even on uh, a PC with four gigabytes of RAM. So that was the the objective here on this uh, data set. Um, so there is likely to be some overfitting. We have uh, a small data set, but this will be part of uh, the discussion then that you can uh, you have on the, the form that you have to fill. There is an optional task, which is optional because it's only worth uh, two out of ten, so ten percent of the grade, and it takes quite a bit more effort than the two points are worth, but uh, it's basically to use a pre-trained network for the feature extraction part. Instead of training your own classifier, do something similar to what you're going to do with the fashion NIST and NIST, but use one of those real uh, networks that you can get from uh, Cadish. So if you go to the, the um, documentation of Keras, you see that you have these kinds of, of networks. I recommend using small ones, for example, these for mobile uh, devices usually are small networks that should fit well uh, in the, uh, your hardware. If you have better hardware, you can experiment with uh, more, uh, with larger networks. But the idea is to check the documentation, see what you need to do to process the images, because, for example, this particular network uh, is expecting values between minus 1 and 1, so you need to convert the images from 0 to 55, which is the byte for the image, into minus 1, 1, and this is uh, an example of what you need to do, but check the documentation to see what you need. And you have here lots of different networks, and you can see the, the papers, what, what they have in special, and uh, to uh, experiment with. Uh, so in this case, if you want to use these pre-trained networks, they will do the feature extraction. You have the, the convolutional part frozen, and then you only train the dense part of the classifier, uh, and then discuss the results, if it's faster, if it helps, uh, and so on. So to sum up, uh, we saw the idea of transfer learning using whatever the model uh, uh, learned in one problem to help solve another. 
and uh, the Keras Functional API, which basically allows you to create your network as a graph with whatever architecture that you want, and it's not limited to just stacking things linearly as a sequential API. The first assignment, you uh, uh, need to submit until May 8th. There is a, a tolerance period of 48 hours, but I recommend you only use that for solving problems with the submission, so try to finish everything before May 8th. Uh, remember to form groups until April 25th. After April 26th, you can submit the assignment in any day that you want, up to the deadline. Uh, check the instructions online, and if there are questions about the instructions, I can update the page to clarify things. This week, uh, you can do the, you'll do the transfer learning exercise. If you have things left uh, from the previous week, for example, if you didn't do the map of the fashion list exercise, you should do that first so that you have the network to, to do transfer learning with. And uh, the first week of May, so 5 and 6 of May, these tutorials will be just for questions about the assignment. Okay? But you have the, the plan for the tutorials uh, there on the page.